This is Julia Siegel. You're listening to the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcast. Previously on Thank You for Your Service. I worry about a decision that appears to be highly political in its nature and using the military as props for a divisive social policy. I think it will politicize our military in a way that's bad for civil military relations. Huntington's view was not, of course, universally accepted. There was a great military sociologist at the University of Chicago named Morris Janowitz who laid out a view that, in fact, the best way to ensure that the military would remain loyal to democracy was by, in fact, deeply politicizing the military, that is, teaching them the virtues of democracy. They actually ended up politicizing the military. Do they have a right to do it? Yes. Are they civilians? Technically, yes. How do the American people see them? They see them as generals, quite frankly. I've been in countries where the military is completely politicized. We wouldn't want to live in any of those countries. Welcome back to Thank You for Your Service, a hard look at American civil military affairs. I'm Thomas Krasnation. And I'm Nick Pereso. Today we're focusing on one of the most prevalent topics of our podcast and of civil military affairs at large, the politicization of the military. Thomas, what do people in the civ mil field mean when they use the term politicization of the military? Well, as we've already seen on this podcast, military politicization is a really broad topic that can mean a lot of different things. A few weeks ago, we asked this question on Twitter and got a number of really good and helpful responses from practitioners and scholars in the CivMil community. You can check out that discussion at our Twitter page at TYFYS underscore podcast. Alice Hunt Friend, a fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, defines a politicized military as one that, quote, exercises loyalty to a single political party and or consistently advocates for and defends partisan political positions and fortunes. Dr. Paul Staniland, an international relations professor here at the University of Chicago, pointed out to us that in various countries around the world, civilian officials use the military to repress political opponents, silence dissent, and ensure that their respective parties stay in power. Uh, the talks which have been going on between the political parties uh, and the various demonstrating groups here in Bangkok uh, came to an end uh, in what were fairly chaotic scenes as the military tried to exert their uh, control over this compound, blocking various entries and exits. The uh, protest leaders were taken away uh, in minibuses surrounded by soldiers. We, it's not entirely clear. Military uh, leaders can also use their strength to manipulate leaders and influence policy decisions. The most extreme step, of course, being overthrowing the government through a military coup. It wasn't clear quite what. Uh, And then the announcement came uh, on Thai television across all the free-to-air channels here uh, that the army had taken uh, full control of power here. We'd been expecting this perhaps over the last couple of days, but uh, with this process of talks in place, it's perhaps a surprise. Like retired Admiral Mike Mullen said in our interview with him, we're fortunate to live in a country that doesn't have a completely politicized military. But in a U.S. context, we still see military politicization in a few very recognizable forms, and the term can encompass actions from the civilian side and from the military side. So you're saying that both civilian officials and military leaders can be responsible for military politicization? Yeah, pretty much. We could see it as active duty and retired members of the military using their credibility to advance partisan viewpoints. Uh, This might take the form of overtly partisan statements in public settings, or it can be more subtle. Dan Marr, an Army lawyer and civil military relations researcher, explained to us that military politicization can happen when, quote, military members or institutions adopt, promulgate, and act on a policy preference in order to shape that policy before it is enacted by civilian authority. This doesn't always have to be because the military leaders are Democrats or Republicans. Dr. Jess Blankshane, a professor at the U.S. Naval War College, told us that, quote, it can also be problematic if the military is seen as just another special interest group engaging in political maneuvers for its own benefit. So, for example, if a president asks for a range of options or plans for military action, and military leaders hold off on presenting options they don't think benefit the military as an institution, that can politicize the military by making them seem like just another player in Washington. So what do civilians do that politicize the military? 
The other side of it is when elected officials leverage the military to advance their respective causes. Captain Marr defines this as, quote, civilian officials exploiting the perceived or apparent legitimacy and credibility of military service members, organizations, institutions, or values for the purpose of enhancing the attractiveness of a partisan position or policy implementation. Because of the fine line between the roles of commander-in-chief and political party leader, Almost every U.S. president gets accused of politicizing the military at some time or another. Most recently, President Trump faced this kind of criticism after his Christmas trip to Iraq, when active duty service members were photographed with campaign gear, and he gave a speech that criticized the Democrats and echoed some of his common rally rhetoric. I don't know if you folks are aware of what's happening. We want to have strong borders in the United States. The Democrats don't want to let us have strong borders. Only for one reason. You know why? Because I want it. And that's what you're fighting for. You know, when you think about it, you're fighting for borders in other countries. And they don't want to fight the Democrats for the border of our country. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So let's talk about military members advancing political viewpoints. Of course, it's important that active duty military officials don't advocate a party platform. In the U.S., it's taken for granted that they don't do that. But a question that is still frequently debated is whether it is ever appropriate for military officials to speak up in a public manner on political issues. Jim Golby, who is an active duty Army strategist working as a policy advisor for the U.S. mission to NATO, recently wrote an article about the Coast Guard Commandant addressing the most recent government shutdown. To provide some context, the U.S. Coast Guard is one of the five military branches but is part of the Department of Homeland Security, not the Department of Defense, and it was one of the agencies that did not receive funding when the government shut down. However, because Coast Guard service members are considered essential government personnel, they were required to work without pay. Many were even forced to turn to food banks and charitable organizations during the shutdown. Admiral Carl Schultz is the Commandant of the Coast Guard, the highest-ranking Coast Guard officer who is responsible for all Coast Guard administration and operations. In a video that went viral on Twitter, Admiral Schultz said, We're five-plus weeks into the anxiety and stress of this government lapse and your non-pay. You, as members of the armed forces, should not be expected to shoulder this burden. I remain heartened by assistance available to you within the lifelines and by the outpouring of support from local communities across the nation. But ultimately, I find it unacceptable that Coast Guard men and women have to rely on food pantries and donations to get through day-to-day -day life as service members. You don't see a lot of statements like this coming from the people who run the branches of the military. But as Golby argues, just because it's uncommon doesn't mean it's inappropriate or a violation of civil military norms. Admiral Schultz's video wasn't partisan, and it didn't call out any particular elected leaders. Instead, he stayed within his lane of military expertise, addressing how a prolonged shutdown was hurting the Coast Guard's readiness. Golby further outlines how generals and admirals, both active duty and retired, could actually speak up more. By sticking to their lanes of military expertise, they can help close the civil-military divide and help citizens foster a better understanding of their military. Some senior military leaders have done a great job of that in the past, like Admiral Mullen, who devoted much of his time as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to public outreach efforts. Nevertheless, there is a concern that partisan actors might take the words and opinions of military officials and try to portray them as coming from one side of the political aisle. As Golby also writes, it is increasingly difficult to make nonpartisan statements about political topics, or more precisely, to make statements that people perceive as nonpartisan. Military advice is always given in a political context, and the political context in America is deeply polarized along partisan lines. As a military leader, you're essentially forced to pick a side, or someone will pick one for you. Some, like Michael Robinson, who's a professor at West Point, have argued that this has worsened under the current administration. In an op-ed for the Washington Post, Robinson argues that President Trump is damaging the military's credibility in three specific ways by, one, pushing retired and active duty military leaders into taking political positions, either supporting or opposing him, two, 
using partisan language to discredit ex-military officers who disagreed with him, and three, provoking what he calls the retired military elite to become politically engaged. One of the generals who has spoken against President Trump is the former commander of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, Army General Stanley McChrystal. In December, when asked in an ABC News interview whether he would work for President Trump's administration, General McChrystal said that he would not, specifically calling into question the president's honesty and morality. If you were asked to join the Trump administration, what would you say? I'd say no. I think it's important for me to work for people who I think are basically honest, who tell the truth as best they know it. You think he's a liar? I don't think he tells the truth. Is Trump immoral in your view? I think he is. And the rest is history. So now the president, no surprise, firing back on Twitter, claiming McChrystal got fired like a dog by Obama. Last assignment, a total bust known for big dumb mouth, Hillary Lover. These events inspired a piece in The Atlantic by Dr. Tom Nichols, a writer and professor at the U.S. Naval War College, entitled Trump Escalates His Assault on Civil-Military Relations. Nichols wrote that no American president has ever dared risk the American civil-military relationship for less cause and with such childish malice. He further argues that Trump has a history of impugning the character and competence of senior U.S. military leaders purely for political reasons. And he warns that soon we could face the most politicized and divided military since Vietnam or even since the Civil War. Dr. Nichols' piece led to a response from another scholar and historian of civil military relations, Dr. McCubin Owens, published in the National Review. Uh, In that article, Owens cautions against the tendency of many commentators, like Nichols, to frame all civil military tensions in apocalyptic or alarmist terms. He describes civil military relations as a bargain between three parties, the uniformed military, civilian policymakers, and the American people, and says that periodically, in response to social, political, technological, and geopolitical changes, this bargain must be renegotiated. Often, what seems to be a crisis is more likely a transition, as the civil-military bargain is in the process of being renegotiated. Uh, He writes that although we should be concerned when civil-military tensions arise, we should not be surprised. In many respects, such tensions are woven into the fabric of the American Republic, and we should avoid hyperbole. As China's role grows greater on the global stage, you want to stay up to date on the issues most pressing to China both domestically and internationally. Check out the Just China podcast for in-depth analysis on recent headlines and investigative reports on Chinese matters that affect our globalized world. We are Just China. Find us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you enjoy your podcast listening. We recently asked Kevin Wang a lecturer at the University of Chicago's International Relations Department, who was our guest for Episode 6, for his thoughts on civil-military relations under the Trump administration. Here's a bit of that conversation. Kevin, considering this debate over the modern politicization of the military, do you think Americans have reason to be alarmed? Not yet. I can see why this may be concerning. I should say, though, that I have not yet seen any truly... I've used this word before, but I cannot see any truly egregious examples of Trump violating the military's operational or bureaucratic autonomy. Uh, But uh, something that does concern me is the crudeness of the language with which the president is able to sort of leverage against military officers, active duty or retired, and, and essentially get away with that type of behavior. I'm afraid of what will happen if that language bleeds into the rhetoric of the average American voter. Right now, if there is sort of any slim comfort, we can arguably say that this is just Donald Trump being Donald Trump, and he leverages ad hominem attacks at anyone he doesn't like, but he's more or less alone in attacking the military. If he's able to do that with a popular mandate, then I would be truly, truly very, very concerned. You're kind of saying that if the average American voter starts to speak about the military in the same way that President Trump does, that might 
erode the civil-military relations we've had in place, kind of erode maybe the trust that we have in the military.